The following program is a presentation of Grace Communion International and Grace Communion Seminary and is made possible by generous donations from viewers like you. On this episode of You're Included, author and theologian Robert T. Walker explores why the Incarnation is good news for humanity. Our host is Dr. J. Michael Fazell. Thanks for joining us, Bob. Uh, what is a Christian missing out on if they don't have an incarnational understanding of the gospel? Brilliant question. Um, I think the first thing they're missing out on is that they do not know uh, that God has come all the way to us where we actually are because the Incarnation says that God has become man. In other words, he's no longer distant. He's actually come himself in person into space and time to do our salvation, uh, to meet us face to face in Jesus. So if we don't have a proper understanding of the Incarnation, that God became man, then we don't know that God is really with us. But also, we don't know that he's really become man to save us. The fact that he's become man means that he has come all the way to what we are and actually achieved our salvation for us as man. So uh, on two counts, uh, in a double sense, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're not aware of just how much God has united himself to us. Most, or a lot of Christians think of Jesus as a role model. Uh, he came to show the way. Uh, we have popular songs, he came to earth to show the way, for example. Um, what's wrong with just seeing him as a role model? Well, if we think that he's come to show us the way, that implies that the way is different from what he is. He's, he says that's the way, uh, walk in it, and he, he shows us. But he's much more than that, he is the way. In John's Gospel, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So he actually, what he's done actually is the way. He is the way. And uh, so it's much, much more than that, just showing us the way. Um, he, he actually has done everything for us, and we come to, to the Father through him. So he himself is the way who has done it for us. Now that would still fit with a role model if, if we think of it in terms of following him. If he's the way, then do we follow him and uh, just try to do what he did? In a way, but at the same time it's more than that because he has done it for us. So we can't copy him in the sense of trying to do what he did uh, because of our sin. But uh, what the Christian life is living in union with him, uh, and so living out of what he has done for us. So rather than trying to, in a sense, copy what he has done so that it's our doing it, he, he's become man to do it for us. And so we make what he's done ours, and we live out of it. So we do the same thing, but not, as it were, in our strength, trying to do it all over again, but uh, through union with him, we find ourselves, because of the Spirit living in us, we find ourselves beginning to live the way he lived. We talk of the Spirit and doing it in the Spirit, but we can't see the Spirit. No, that's uh, right. So how do we know that the Spirit is at work in us? Well, um, we're familiar with light. I mean, you go into a room and it's dark. You, we flick a switch and the light comes on, and we actually can't see light. Mm. But we can see what light lights up, and it's the Spirit that uh, open, uh, gives us the eyes to see Christ and makes Christ real for us, so that if we know Christ, then we know it's through the Spirit. The Spirit is the one who opens us up uh, to live out of Christ. You say if, that he's already uh, done it for us. Mm -hmm. If that's so, then um, why do we... What is it that we're trying to do? In other words, if he's already done everything that necessary for our salvation, what 
is left for us to do for ourselves. In one sense, nothing. Uh, but in another sense, uh, everything. It's to joyfully live out the life that he has remade for us. If we think of it in the sense that he has come and he's taken our fallen, dying uh, humanity that wastes away, gets older, dies, and then disintegrates in the grave. He's taken our life, he's actually remade it uh, in his own life. And, and that's what the resurrection is about. That's the remaking of our life. So he gives us our new humanity. So what we're living out is our new humanity that he gives us. So we're not trying to copy him. We couldn't. We couldn't rise from the dead. Well, that's just the trouble, isn't it? We, we, we try to uh, do what Jesus says, but we fall short. Yes. We, may, we may be successful to some degree, or at least from time to time, but we fall short and then we feel guilty and, the, and we feel anxious and fearful. Mm -hmm. the, how, can, how can we be part of the kingdom of God? How can we be saved because we fall short and because we're not following Christ as we should? And so we're fearful. But incarnational theology, looking at or seeing the gospel the way you're describing, uh, doesn't push us back on how well we perform. It sounds like you're saying. No, it um, uh, it uh, points us to Christ, and so that we see His humanity, the life that He lived as our life. So we don't see that He's done something; we have to copy it. We see what He's done. That that is our life. He was born for us. His birth at Bethlehem is our new birth. When He died, that was our death. When he rose, that was our resurrection. Uh, uh, when he ascended into heaven, he took us with him. I mean, this is all what Paul says. So that, um, and that's the meaning of faith, that we, we understand that he so came into our place to live for us, that everything that he did is ours. And so we live uh, out of that. Uh, and that takes away all the, the strain and the burden and gives a whole new dimension to Christian living. Um, we live in his strength, uh, not in our strength. I mean, it, it, we live with all, with all our strength. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, uh, we are fully released to live to the full. And yet, in a real sense, we're not living in our strength. We're living in Christ's strength. But that liberates us. Uh, to live fully. Then the gospel is not about calling people to good behavior. It's about letting people know and calling them to a new identity, who they are in Christ, to a relationship with God in Christ. And that's different from it's a whole different uh, uh, point of the gospel, isn't it? Because don't we usually think of the gospel as being uh, a call to straighten out your life? That's right. In other words, you're a sinner, and and didn't you know it? You now now that you know you're a sinner, you need to be uh, forgiven of those sins, and so so we're forgiven. We're told to behave better, and the Holy Spirit will help you, and and Jesus shows the way. And the whole goal is a better me through good behavior. Yes. But the gospel is not all about that. No, it's much more than that. It's, it's not just that God has come to show us what we ought to do. He's actually come to do himself for us what we ought to do. He's taken our human life and he's remade it. And so what he gives us in Christ, and this comes over especially at the at the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist, he gives us our new humanity. So our task is to live out our new humanity. We don't start by trying to remake ourselves. We have been remade in Christ. So we live out the new identity, as you put it, uh, in union with Christ through the Spirit. So it's the Gospel's declaration that you've been made new, therefore 
uh, live like it. Yes, not exactly. not live good so that God will give you the kingdom. No, it's, it's well then this, that's the opposite of what we typically hear. Yes, that's exactly right. It's putting the the, the horse before the cart instead yeah. of the other way. That's right, and that's and of course the gospel, the word uh, means good news. And it's not good news that we have to no, yeah, make ourselves always, better. Yeah. The good news is that we have been made better, yeah. already been renewed. Uh, it, you know. It's almost like it's the gospel's good news if you could achieve it. Yes. But sorry, you never will. That's right. You can try very hard, though, and that'll make you happier. But usually it won't make us happier because we'll know we can't <laughs> do it. We'll be more frustrated yeah, yeah. and give up or whatever we do. Yeah. And the, the, but the exciting thing about the Incarnation is that it's God himself uh, come to do it, and he's doing it as man. And that immediately takes us into the whole doctrine of the Trinity, uh, Father, Son, and Spirit. And that opens up a whole new richer dimension uh, uh, to Christian thought uh, and living. And how does it do that? Well, for one thing, um, this, this is what God is. The real God is Father, Son, and Spirit. Uh, we're, we're used to thinking of God as a kind of single being out there, far off. Uh, but when we know God in Christ, in Jesus, then we discover that God is Father, Son, and Spirit. And so we come to know the real God for the first time. Calvin says if we don't distinctly conceive God as Father, Son and Spirit, then we don't really know God. It's partly just coming to know the real God. And, but also, the real God is a communion of love. Uh, the Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Father. Uh, they live in the communion of love with the Spirit. And that is the nature of God, uh, the three persons of God. That doesn't mean there are three gods, uh, there's one God, and yet somehow uh, he exists, he is Father, Son and Spirit, and they exist in relation. And when we begin to think in that way, then we begin to think of ourselves not just as individuals, an individual here and a separate individual there, we begin to think of ourselves in the human race as interconnected persons in relation. So it has also has an implication for a much richer and deeper sense of community. Now the doctrine of the Trinity is, uh, a lot of people are a bit scared of it, um, but uh, I don't think they need to be. It's into that that Christ brings us. Then, if, if we're if we're one with Him, if He comes to it and takes us in, takes humanity, us, into Himself, and He's in that eternal communion of love, then we're in that eternal communion of love with Him. That's right. And that's the, that's the way things are. That's right. It's been done. He already did it. And that's the miracle of the ascension. When Jesus ascended, still wearing our humanity, he took our humanity into the heart of God. So there's now a man in the heart of God. He's still human, um, but, and that's our destiny, uh, to, uh, to live in, uh, in fellowship with God. When we think of, of people, we automatically think of people as complete individuals. I mean, you're a totally different in individual from, from what I am. And if, I, if somebody knows you, they don't have a clue what I'm like. But with the Trinity, it's different because the persons are so interrelated, they're, they're different and they remain different. They're each totally God. The Father's completely God, the Son's completely God, the Spirit's completely God and yet they live in relation, and in such a close relation that when we look at the Son and see the face of the Son, then we know what the Father is like. 
the son is the image of the father. You know, you're different. So that someone looks at you, they don't know what I'm like. But it's opposite when we look at Christ. He's the image of the Father. He's the Son of the Father. So to know the Son is to know the Father. And Jesus says that. Uh, and Philip says, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. And Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Especially through John's Gospel. When we listen to the words of Jesus and we're drawn into his relationship with the Father, and we begin to, to cotton on somehow slowly. We, we uh, through the Spirit, we begin to think in this deeper interpersonal way. Uh, we begin to understand something of his relation to the Father. And that's the heart of the Gospel, you know, the relation between the Father and the Son and the Spirit that he has come to share with us. So it, it, when we talk about Trinitarian theology, are we talking about something complicated or something simple? It's both at once. Um, and the simplest things are often the, the profoundest things, or often, put it the other way, the profoundest things are, are often the simplest things. There's a profound simplicity here. Um, the person with the simplest faith can understand uh, the Son, and the Son being the image of the Father uh, and the Spirit. But obviously, this is something that stretches our minds. That doesn't mean that we have to be intellectual or, or brilliant academically, because it's not that kind of understanding. It's more a different way of thinking, um, so that it's profound. Uh, there's a deep simplicity, and yet at the same time, there's, it's profound. I think complicated is the wrong word. People often worry that theology is not for them, or the Trinity is not for them, because they haven't got the mind to understand it. But the thing with God is that God makes himself known to us. So it's, this, it's back to this thing about faith. We shouldn't think of our faith, have we got enough faith? So we shouldn't think of enough reason, have we got enough reason, enough intelligence to understand? It's more about who the God is we're trying to understand. If we focus on him, he gives us understanding. He makes us known. He makes himself known. Now, often, in the nature case, when, you, uh, when we learn something new, if it's really new, we don't know it. So how do we learn something that we don't know? It might seem impossible. We all do. You will make breakthroughs. And slowly, slowly, gradually, the pieces fall into place. So if we have confidence in what we're trying to understand and in the, the person who is making himself known, we just hang in there and listen and wait. And then God gives us understanding. We're led deeper into this whole way of thinking, especially, I think, through reading John's Gospel. With some of the most simple things, such as if you go outside in, 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 in the evening and you, you look at the sunset and you look at the stars, you can appreciate the profound beauty and you're drawn into that. That's right. And you have that sense of inspiration and beauty and whether or not you ever study sunsets and stars and how they work. And, what, and so many people do, many people study them. Uh, and study everything from sensory appreciation, from visual, uh, how, the, how we process uh, things we see, to uh, how, what, uh, how stars are made. There are so many different things you could learn more about from a sunset and a starry evening, uh, but you don't have to, to stand there and appreciate it and be taken up by it. No, that's right. And it's the same whether you know more about it or not. It's still itself. Yes. It, I wonder if, um, if the gospel is somewhat like that. There's a simplicity in Christ in simply trusting Christ to be our all in all. And, and it's so. He is everything He is for us and with us, in us, whether we study more about it or not. That's right. But we can 
it's something we can explore forever joyfully and yes. never come to the end of. Yes, and um, I mean, the more we know Christ, I would say, the more we are drawn into understanding his riches. And Paul um, says that we should be mature in our thinking and have a, re uh, have a reason for the hope that's in us. And the letter to the Hebrews says you know, similar things. So it's part of our calling to, um, in knowing Christ uh, and being drawn into this profound uh, adoration and love and worship, to do that with the whole of ourselves, and that includes our minds, so that we, um, we come to understand it deeper. It's not academic, it's, it's a kind of different way of understanding that we all have, because we're all made to know, and we're all made in the image of God, to know and understand and think more deeply than we think we're able to, but that's given to us. Uh, my grandmother was um, Tom Torrance's mother. Um, she was um, uh, an evangelical um, and with a profound, simple faith. But for Tom, she was the, the theologian in the family, simply because of her spiritual insight, not through any academic you know, learning. If we want to understand the gospel in a, in a truly gospel way then, for what it is and for what the truth of the gospel is, or even if we want to help somebody else understand it, what, what is the, the, the bottom line? What is the simple thing that we need to and, and can know whether we ever pick up a theology book? That God was in Christ. Uh, reconciling the world to himself and that through what he has done as God and man for us our lives have been renewed in him and he, he, uh, he gives us uh, our new humanity. So, so our faith then, the thing that we're asked to believe is something that is true for us whether we believe it or not. That's right. Even before we believe it. That's right. That's profoundly true. And Paul said, while we were enemies, we were reconciled. Even before, while we still hated God, uh, before we ever heard the gospel, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. So the gospel is the message of what has happened for us in Jesus. And so when we hear it, it's good news. It's like the story of the Japanese... Um, soldier uh, in, the, uh, I think it was the Second World War, uh, who was marooned on an island and he, uh, no one knew he was there. He didn't know the war had ended and he, he was discovered sort of 20 years later or something. And you know, they told him the war's ended, <laughs> you know, the good news. Um, so the gospel is hearing the good news that God has done it. It seems that some people don't want the, to to commit themselves to the gospel because they they because of the way it's presented they're given something that really isn't the gospel they're given a this idea that you're going to enter into something where you will need to achieve salvation by doing certain things you've got to first of all repent of your sins, and then you, you, you can't be sure if you've repented of all of them exactly, perhaps. Uh, there's so many barriers, it seems, that, that keep you from, from being able to experience joy or, or rest. It's not a, it's, it's not a gospel of rest that, that we hear preached so often. It's kind of a gospel of anxiety. Yes. Um, you're in big trouble, and you'd better do something to get out of that trouble, or God is going to um, send you to hell. So we, we're we looking for a way to, to avoid hell, uh, but, get, but have to do something that we're not even sure we can do in order to avoid hell. It's just a, a confused uh, kind of a... And yet we're saying this is good news. God loves you, so receive him. But he's going to send you to hell if you don't, because well, that's, that's how he really feels about you. Yeah, I mean, that's, to put it in that way, it's not the gospel. 
but you've you just put it uh, what you've said is what is just what uh, many people believe. Uh, the gospel is that God has come to make himself known by making himself known that inevitably just exposes us for what we are. And but he has, and that is a, a, a judgment on us. You know that we are not what we ought to be. But God has taken his judgment on himself, his own judgment on himself, and has undone our sin and put it all in the past and risen into a new life in the resurrection. And that is ours now through the gospel. So we are called to live out the new life that Jesus achieved um, uh, in the, that he lived out in his life and uh, achieved uh, in a permanent sense in the resurrection. That's good news. Yes. And it doesn't require fear. It's, uh, we can rest. Yes, that's right. I want to ask just one last thing in a minute or two we have remaining. If there's one thing that you would want people to know about God, what would that be? That he loves us and that he is love in himself. That's his very nature. And that he loves us so much that he has even entered into our hell for us uh, on the cross. He's taken our God forsakenness and undone it and cleared away all the barriers between us and him uh, and united us to himself. He's taken our, our, our very flesh, our dust, and made it his. He's now a man in Christ. Uh, and so he's done all that for us. He's now with us, one with us. You've been watching You're Included, a production of Grace Communion International.